Sonic Adventure 2 is easily one of the most important games in my entire life. I urge you not to click off the video when I say that it's the first console game I've ever played. Already there's kind of an expectation that I'm just going to praise it to high heavens thanks to my nostalgia, but I promise I have fair critiques to be sure. This is a very personal video I've wanted to do since the beginning. Nowadays I don't like to think of my videos as reviews because what they represent are simply my experiences in gaming, not really something made to recommend what you should or should not play. Last time I tried to highlight what made Sonic Adventure stick out among the crowd, and today I'm going to emphasize what made Sonic Adventure 2 the highest rated Sonic game all the way up until 2017. Because like its predecessor, the game's reputation nowadays is far more divisive. Despite that, it's probably the most iconic game in the series next to Sonic the Hedgehog 1. You would think that title would belong to the first Sonic Adventure, but something about this game apparently clicked with people. Who'd have thought that a random GameCube game my friend introduced me to would turn out to be a landmark in this big franchise? A landmark indeed. This is the first title to ever be marketed as an anniversary game. Sonic had been around for 10 years, and boy did they want to show how much the series had grown. Now, while this may be the first console game I've ever played, and by extension the first Sonic game I've ever played, I do not have significantly more nostalgia with it than I do the Genesis games or Sonic Adventure 1. I picked those up pretty soon after, and so with that knowledge, I can firmly say that Sonic Adventure 2 is indeed the next epic thing they were going for. It's gonna be a long video, I naturally have a lot to say, and if that's an issue, I do apologize, but it's time to dive in. It's time to tell the story of what this game did to become a legend. File select. Oh, if there is one word I can use to describe this game, it is aesthetic. In the prior video, I mentioned how much I love Yuji Uakawa's character designs, and those are everywhere on this game's interface. I guess it's kind of a weird point to start out with, but really, open the game up and it just has this very unique feeling to it, a distinct, <sighs> say it with me now, edge that really cements it in your memory. Sonic Adventure 2 has theming. The core theme being hero versus dark, battle to save the world or conquer it. In later releases for this game, there's a signature intro where Sonic and Shadow cross paths in front of a moon and like, ah, I love that. They even reference it later in Generations because it's that cool. The logo, it's got this yin and yang thingy going on, even the beta logo had it. And of course, we can't mention good versus evil without talking about our playable cast. I mentioned how the character artwork pops out on the menus, you know, among the ever cool looking assets, but like, the characters themselves really make a presence for the game. I didn't mention it before, but the last character you played in Sonic Adventure 1 would narrate the menu next time you booted it up. Select your character! In Sonic Adventure 2, you get to select a character to theme the entire interface after, with their own background and dialogue. It's really cool. What? You don't like me? What? I'm not good enough for you? But on top of neat visuals and other traits I'll mention as we go along, the characters each play a major part in the story. In Sonic Adventure, it's pretty agreed that most of the story revolved around Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles, with the other three feeling kinda minor in the grand scheme of things, even if they had a good story to tell on their own. But in Sonic Adventure 2, each character has a rival on the opposing side and plays an equivalent role. On top of a sleeker menu design, the game itself only takes place through two stories now as opposed to six, meaning that the narrative is pretty streamlined. However, segregating six characters characters into two stories must be a major change to the game, right? Well, yes, and for the most part, I feel it works out for the better. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I just wanted to illustrate that the game has an appealing first impression. The Sonic Adventure 2 battle box art just screams awesome, like how do you not want to at least inspect it upon seeing it at Blockbuster Video? And I mean, I couldn't go without mentioning that with the hero in Dark Scenario, this means you get to finally play as Dr. Robotnik in a Sonic platformer. You get to actively play as the villains of a story. Well, as tempting as that offer sounds, most people probably pick the hero side story first, and so it begins. Sonic Adventure 2. Sigma Alpha 2 heading due south over the city. We're en route, everything's a go. This is Control Tower. We have you on radar. Report cargo status of captured Hedgehog aboard. Over. That's a 10-4. Cargo secured on board and... What? Then the copy that. Over. Gone. He's taking out everyone aboard and... What's wrong? What in the Come world? Here. Over. Freeze! What do you think you're doing? Get that Hedgehog! Talk about low-budget flights. No food or movies. I'm out of here. I like running better. Yeah! 
Oh. My. God. Now, if that didn't really in, I don't know what would. Sonic apparently got arrested, jumped out of a military helicopter, ripped a part of a wing off, and used it as a snowboard to go down the slopes of San Francisco without any snow. As a Californian kid myself, this was the coolest thing I had ever seen. And my god, what an improvement from the slow, weirdly animated opening cutscene of Sonic Adventure. This image of Sonic cheekily looking at the camera and spinning down to the city below? Money shot. But let's not beat around the bush. City Escape. Oh man, this is quite possibly the most endearing 3D Sonic level. You have the opening where you shred the road and send cars flying with sick tricks and the game goes cool. And then you land and, yep, Sonic controls just about as good as he did before. But now there are these big gun robots as your main enemies because the whole level Sonic is on the run from the military. Also, now Sonic can grind on rails, complete with these new grinding shoes up in the game's extreme factor. And do I even need to mention the music? No, I don't. But, but, how do you beat a killer whale destroying the boardwalk? Well... <laughs> Holy shit! Yeah, okay, that, that is a standout opening to a game. Now, of course, I should be fair. Many don't really think it's that great because it's a linear shoot to the exit, and that's okay. But I don't really care because what I'm doing is super fun anyway. Besides, there are numerous shortcuts that reward skillful playing, a few things here and there to look out for if you bother to explore, and what the game lacks in open design, it makes up for with... The ranking system. Those cool, nice, tight points earlier, you want to get a whole bunch of those by the time you finish each level, and so it basically inspires you to play as fast, but also as stylish as possible. Grind those rails, jump those ramps, get the blink and you'll miss it gold beetle. Even if you don't care to get a crowning achievement at the end, the thing that makes the linearity of Sonic Adventure 2 stages really fun is the fact that you're almost always active during them, and again, great control. So yeah, I think City Escape is a worthy successor to Emerald Coast. After that, Gun finally catches up to Sonic and produces the first boss fight. Once you easily beat it, the fan favorite character Shadow the Hedgehog appears. It turns out that Sonic was arrested because the military has mistaken him for the likes of Shadow. So, where does he think he's going with- ah, sorry. So yeah, basically Sonic is really pissed and tries to confront Shadow, but then Shadow initiates Chaos Control. Did I mention how I really like the cinematic shots in this game? Baffled by his new counterpart, Sonic is taken aback long enough to be cornered by Gun and arrested again. Damn it. Then we go back to the adventure field where we... no? No, now we're taken to the perspective of Knuckles, who is fighting another new character, Rouge the Bat. Rouge stole the Master Emerald because she is obsessed with jewelry. Simple enough, I guess. Suddenly, Robotnik appears and steals it from both of them, prompting Knuckles to remember what happened last time. Knowing that he can restore the Master Emerald if it's broken, he flies up and scatters the pieces around the region. Of course, Rouge freaks out, and the two race to hunt the fragments. And so, yes, you don't go back to an adventure field in this game, no, you just go straight to the next level. Furthermore, now you're controlling a different character and gameplay style within the same story. In the last video, I brought up the numerous positives about the scope I thought the adventure field offered. I also brought up that I didn't mind multiple gameplay styles that much because they were stories of her own. I was never interrupted as Sonic to play as big. So one would think that I'm not too happy about this massive change for Sonic Adventure 2, but you would be wrong. Really, I think both structures have their merits. In this game, it makes sense for the story to be arranged how it is. There are two sides to this conflict, two teams working together, and as we'll see later, time is of the essence, so the pacing is enhanced by the lack of hub worlds. Now, as far as switching gameplay styles, I guess that would be obnoxious if I didn't find them good to play, but... Knuckles the Echidna plays as he did in the previous game, now with his own stages. This, as I opined in the last video, allows for less restricted, more creative level design. And... wait, what is that sound? Gonna get those fools. They want to play with my hammer rules. They play with the wrong guy. Heck, I don't know. That's what I'm representing. Never seen a Mike Hogg spit like a menace. Ah more creative music as well. Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah. So Knuckles controls well again, that's great. In fact, no, I think he controls even better. He feels faster, and now he's got this drill dive attack where he can go up high and torpedo all the way down. It makes traversing levels a lot more fun. He can swim too, but I know what you want me to talk about. I shan't delay it any further. The Emerald Radar. Sonic Adventure. Any shard in your vicinity would be picked up on the radar. Sonic Adventure 2. It only picks up one at a time. Now, why would that be? Sonic Adventure. Your hints come in the form of T-Call flying to where the Emerald is located. 
complicated. Sonic Adventure 2, you get actual hints from monitors. Now, some could say that this makes it a lot harder to get the emeralds, and yes, yes it does. But you may remember, I didn't quite fancy the way it was handled before. You know how when you're looking for easter eggs as a kid, your parents are typically waving you in the direction you're supposed to be looking? That's Sonic Adventure. And that's not really to say it sucked or anything, but like, I prefer being older and looking on my own with maybe an uncle around the corner to give a vague hint every now and then. Now, yes, it does suck that I can be right next to a piece that the radar just won't pick up, causing me to waste more time, but that is unfortunately a side effect of what I otherwise consider to be a much better hint system. I've heard it said many a time that these hints are worthless unless you know the entire level, and I don't know what these people are talking about. You can use three hints per shard. The first will be pretty vague, but the second will be a lot more helpful, and the third should make it a dead ringer. The downside is that hints will lower your score, however, using hints will not destroy your rank if you are using them in moderation and paying attention to your surroundings. So if anything, they are tools to help you if you are really stuck and you want to get it done quicker. But in the first place, if we're discussing how long it takes to just get through the level and move on in a story, well, I'll just say that I didn't need to be a speedrunner to figure out that I'm supposed to use the clues the game provided to make progress. I didn't expect to get an A rank my first try anyway. Not sure why I would. <laughs> Anywho, that little tangent aside, I think these stages are actually a lot better than what we got before because they require me to be more engaged with the layout. I'll get more into aspects I don't really like later, but for now, Wild Canyon is a fine level. And as the first Knuckles level, it's very easy to beat it without using hints anyway. It has a reliable means of vertical transport, it has significant landmarks, and it's able to take full advantage of the way Knuckles controls. Meanwhile, Tails spouts exposition to himself while flying a tornado. Yeah, okay, but seriously, he heard that Sonic got arrested on TV. TV, and like any good 8 year old sidekick, he sprang into his new mech to break the law and bust Sonic out of jail. Yeah, when I was a kid, Tails was one of my favorite characters for this reason. Even dating back to Sonic 2, where despite being rather young and shy, Tails was eager to prove himself capable, it's kinda relatable. Anyway, it appears Amy also got the idea to raid the military base. And so did Robotnik. Because Amy apparently can't fight him herself, Tails steps in, and now we have our first character battle. <laughs> Oh boy, a Tails level. Well, I love how Tails controlled in Adventure 1, but with original levels, oh, this'll be great. Oh, he's still in the mech. Throw it in the trash. I'm just kidding. So yes, E102's gameplay lives on in spirit through Tails. Now, while I would like to play Tails as I would normally, I'm not really going to question why he wants extra firepower to break into a military base. Contextually, I think it's plausible, even if a tad arbitrary. The real reason why there is this drastic change in the character's moveset is because it was actually Robotnik who adopted Gamma's playstyle, and they needed an equally genius rival to balance it out. Well, there is one other reason, but I'll discuss that later. So basically, the three gameplay styles I I liked most in the first game have been kept and geared up for this game. To me, this is only good news. Both stories share the same three gameplay styles, hence the rivaling characters. Now, for Sonic and Knuckles, I thought their gameplay was mainly improved, feeling more organic and focused on what that respective character does best. So the mech shooting? Yeah, I think the same thing. Heresy, I know, but if you remember, my one critique with Gamma was that his levels were too short and too easy. Again, a byproduct of having to share levels with other characters. In Adventure 2, the level design is more catered to the idea, so it feels more satisfying. But there are a few key differences. For one, no timer, just get to the goal. Two, Tails has a health bar that he refills with rings. I guess they figured it'd be taking so much damage that the normal ring system wasn't good enough? Then again, I guess if I could recollect rings, the bosses would literally be no challenge. And three, this is the thing that people really don't like about these levels, I turn somewhat slower. Ooh. The actual reason for this is so that you can aim around at targets without moving everywhere, but of course, if it's a Sonic game, slower equals worse. 
right? Well, again, as I said for Gamma, it is a slower gameplay style than that of Sonic or Knuckles, but it's not too slow or dragged out to where I feel like it's jarringly different. It's not like, oh man, the new turning is so bad where I'm juking and weaving in my seat to try and get my bearings in now. But at the end of the day, for me, what matters most is that the gameplay fits within the parameters set up by the game. It doesn't need to be my hyper-specific taste of what Sonic should be. Sonic Adventure prioritizes action platforming. Big the Cat is not that. Sonic Adventure 2 further accentuates the action by utilizing points, making the Sonic levels crazier, adding more dynamic gimmicks to Knuckles levels, and allowing Tails to blow up even more shit than Gamma could. What I mostly care about is fun in its own right, not the subset of which fun is, and that is what I always get from SA2. In Tails levels, you're rewarded with points by racking up lock-on combos. This, in my opinion, makes it to where you're always active like the other two playstyles. I mean, not only are there a lot more enemies, eh, maybe even too much, but the act of speeding through, mowing down rows of gun robots with proper timing, I don't know, I find it rather badass. Uh, moving on. Tails allows Amy to go rescue Sonic, presenting this quotable moment. The reason I'm in here is because of that fake hedgehog. You mean that black hedgehog? Did you see it? Where is it now? If I tell you, will you marry me? No way! I thought I had you this time! Charm, character, it's, uh, it's nice. Oh yeah, there's also foreshadowing with writing on the walls that Sonic didn't do. <gasps> okay, from this point onward, I'm not gonna detail the whole game like I've done so far. I just wanted to show exactly how the game feels when you first boot it up, how the gameplay styles and levels have been greatly reworked from SA1. Still gonna go through the story and mention what needs to be mentioned about the gameplay, but there's like 30 levels in this game, so I'll have to lay off a bit. But that said, Metal Harbor, this level fucking rocks. There's a bunch of military fights fighter jets, the scenery is all bright, and of course, Sonic rides a space rocket for no apparent reason, only to bust through another shaft and board his way to the jungle. To get an A rank, it's basically required that you get to the very top of the rocket, and the timing on this is tighter than my asshole gets while playing it. Mm. Also, at one point you have to take a little detour to get... The Light Dash! Yeah, character upgrades are back, and you get them in levels now. Cool. In Sonic Adventure, the light speed dash was a neat ability that let you dash along a trail of rings. Only problem was that you had to stop and charge it with a spin dash. In this game, you can do it by simply pressing the B button near some rings. However, this kind of sucks. Same button syndrome. It's a problem that these games suffer with all the way up to Unleashed. It's gone from being a minor inconvenience in the classics to being pretty annoying in the 3D games. There are so many times where I want to do a dash, but I keep doing this new somersault move like a doofus. And I get really anxious when they put these over bottomless pits because guess what also uses the B button? But hey, when it works, the light dash is the B's knees. It's another reason why Metal Harbor is fun. I really like chaining together strings of light speed. <clears throat> and now, the cutscene you've all been waiting for. Whew. So far, so good. Hey, that's... That blue hedgehog again of all places. I found you, Faker. Faker? I think you're the fake hedgehog around here. You're comparing yourself to me? Huh. You're not even good enough to be I'll my make you eat those words! My entire life I've always wondered what makes this cutscene so quotable. Is it the music? Well, yes. Is it the cockiness in Shadow's voice counteracting the incredibly pissed off Sonic? Perhaps. Is it the fact that, like a real heated encounter, Sonic interrupts Shadow as he's speaking? Also probably yes. For whatever reason, no rivalry can match that of Sonic and Shadow. It's a very welcome dynamic. And how about that boss fight? Uh, ooh, and as if the last scene wasn't enough, how about this part? Shadow, what are you doing? Hurry and get back here right now before the island blows up with you on it! Blows up? The choreography of these cutscenes, it's amazing. So then, Robotnik actually succeeds in blowing up an entire military island with our heroes just barely escaping. Good lord! Whatever he's up to, it's clear that Robotnik's forces are more powerful than the entire United Federation Army. Figured I'd mention it because it's kind of worth asking why Gunn hasn't been able to do anything about him in the past. Elsewhere, Knuckles is still searching for the Master Emerald, so we're in Pumpkin Hill. You ready? This is where the treasure hunting begins to really open up. Pumpkin Hill is considerably bigger than Wild Canyon, and as such, Knuckles gets a ton of room to glide around. I quite like it. There are three major landmarks and also rockets to help you get up high, so it never feels like you're getting lost or taking too long to get to where you want to go. And just, I mean, look at this place. How can you forget the absolute spook that is Pumpkin Hill? One concern many people have with the world of Sonic is the realism of 3D games 
games took, but I guess I never found it to be an issue until 06 took it to the logical extreme. It's still the Sonic universe, where you have giant pumpkin mountains, bungee vines, and a kindergarten janitor who runs a black market in his closet where he sells the newborns of his own kind. I'm not making that up. So yeah, despite the not US military getting involved, this still very much feels like a Sonic game. Speaking of which... Citizens of Earth, lend me your ears and listen to me very carefully. My name is Dr. Eggman. Ugh! He said his name is Dr. Eggman. Yeah, Sonic Adventure 2 signifies Dr. Robotnik officially referring to himself as Dr. Eggman in the West. His real name is still canonically Dr. Ivo Robotnik, but I guess he grew accustomed to the name Sonic used to make fun of him with. After all, he is the one making egg-themed robots. Anyway, Dr. Eggman unveils a new space station that happens to be in the shape of his face, like the Death Egg, and... Oh, Eggman blows up half the moon as a threat to humanity that if they don't surrender in 24 hours, dire consequences will happen. Jesus. We're not at the end of the game yet, but the stakes are already pretty well done. And this is by far one of Eggman's shining moments, sending the entire world into mass hysteria with the press of a button. There's way more to discuss about him later, but this, coupled with the destruction of Prison Island, establishes that Eggman is even more dangerous than he was before. So our heroes witness this and come to the conclusion that Eggman is probably searching for more Chaos Emeralds to power up the space colony. Tails apparently has one himself and can use it to track the others. But of course, Sonic, Tails, and Amy are now technically criminals, so they gotta avoid the police as well. I like how extreme the government is about trying to capture them. You had the entire city escape thing, but now you got million dollar wanted posters, bullshit fighter jets, destroyed highways, it's a war zone just to capture a little boy in a mech. In Mission Street, Tails will also get the jet boosters, which make his levels a lot more fun, allowing players to not only platform faster, but also to take really big shortcuts. Again, I do not find the mechs too clunky at all. The next day, as everything is settling down, Tails discovers that the rest of the emeralds aren't really picking up on radar, inferring that Eggman took them all into space. And then, oh, Knuckles coincidentally bumps into our heroes after finding more shards in Aquatic Mine. Side note, I want to mention that this is the level where people probably start to dislike Knuckles stages, and I mean, I get it. It's a multi-tiered water level. I don't find it a huge pain in the ass to do. It's pretty easy to navigate the central area, although it's not really fun when the emeralds spawn on the side hallways. That can get a bit labyrinthine for my liking. But the real reason I mentioned Aquatic Mine is because there's a particular upgrade hidden deep within the bowels of a level that lets Knuckles breathe underwater. This is very helpful for a later level, but I'm not using it because most people aren't going to know about it by first playthrough. Anyway, Tails figures out that Eggman is negotiating with the president, and if they can trace the call, they can locate Eggman. And now we get a driving level. Think of it like this game, Sky Chase. Only more fun. I mean, all you're doing is trying to get to the end before the time runs out and you lose your target. You only do this once per story, but it's pretty easy and self expl Ow! Yay, we found the president. Sonic and Tails jump into the president's unguarded limo and steal his transcripts. No fucks given. Then our heroes group up at Eggman's secret pyramid base, to which Knuckles also joins because... I saw Eggman go inside the pyramid. And more importantly, I saw that Batgirl go inside with him as well. Well, you saw them too, right? Well, yeah! So now we initiate this epic moment where everybody except Amy storms the base. Tails gets a fun level with plenty of shortcuts and explosives, Sonic gets a really cool level and a way past cool ability, and Knuckles gets probably the worst level in the game. Yeah, I think that's about right. The other two levels go by quickly and feel really satisfying to pull off, but Death Chamber is a bit of a maze. Every other Knuckles level is fine by me because it's usually one wide big area that's easy to navigate. Death Chamber, however, is split by a whole bunch of hallways, upper areas, and side rooms, and every door needs to be opened by hitting an hourglass switch. This is where the radar actually does become a big problem, as it takes a long amount of time to go back and forth throughout the layer. Even with hints, the level tends to drag on a bit too much, and this is coming from someone who's played the game quite a bit. I guess that's another thing to consider. I don't find the other gameplay styles much worse than Sonic, because I'm almost never stuck in a level long enough to ever boring to play. Even if they aren't necessarily the same high-speed action, they don't feel slow because they're paced incredibly well. With this in mind, Death Chamber is a good example of 
how not to do a treasure hunting stage. One thing I also want to point out about this pyramid chapter is that you actually fight some new enemies. Eggman's Bad Mix, complete with small animals popping out instead of a Chaos Drives used to power the gun robots. Now for Hidden Base, you also fight a few gun robots, but these decrease as you get deeper into the pyramid of Sonic and Knuckles. This is because Gun is onto Eggman, but they aren't really able to make a breach. It's a pretty minuscule detail, but it's consistency that I appreciate nonetheless. Also, Eggman has mass-produced E-1000 robots which resemble Gamma. It kind of reminds me of Wily and his fondness for Gutsman. I got sidetracked. Sorry, I just kind of like how the charm of Sonic Adventure is still present. Despite my earlier jokes about the character battles, two pretty decent bosses are thrown at you at the end of Eggman's base. King Boom Boo scared the bejesus out of me as a kid. I literally remember not beating the game for a month because I was too afraid. Ugh. Oh, but it's a good fight. I like how ridiculously fast Knuckles runs away from him. Like, look at him go! You're supposed to wait until he starts barfing fire so you can go around him and weaken him with light. And when you do this, if you're really good, you can catch up to him multiple times to beat on him before the light comes back. It's way more fun than most of the bosses in SA1. Then, as it looks like you're in the clear, Eggman surprises Sonic with the Egg Golem. Much like King Boom Boo, the fight doesn't feel too dragged down by mandatory waiting. A skilled player can make the fight go faster by accurately predicting the boss's movements. Finally, everyone boards one of Eggman's space rockets. That egghead sure loves mechanical things, doesn't he? I'll bet he has one or two spaceships lying around here somewhere. <coughs> and they head off into outer space. So this is the space colony where Eggman is hiding. What the? Is everyone all right? We should be oh, landing no. soon. The hatch doors Don't are open. sweated, Knuckles. The only thing in the cargo bay are those master emeralds. What do you mean, emeralds. don't sweat it? Right? Land the Knock shuttle and off, let Knuckles. me out. We're gonna crash this thing if you keep that up. Oh no! Don't touch that lever! Okay, I guess it's that time where we talk about those wacky cutscenes. Despite my general enthusiasm for these cutscenes, they do leave a bit to be desired. They're a vast improvement over the slow, plotting cutscenes of Adventure 1, but I would be lying if I said they haven't shown their age at all. Most notably, the lit movement is still synced to the Japanese dialogue. It's less distracting than it is in SA1 because the facial animation is much better, and I feel they made it work fine for the most part. Yeah, we'll see about that, Batgirl. But it undeniably takes me out of the immersion when it doesn't work so well. Well, if you gotta know, I caught a ride with Tails. Secondly, instead of having stock animations where the characters stand there awkwardly, Sonic Adventure 2 employs the use of motion capture. This does mean that the range of animation is substantially improved, however, it can lead to some jank moments, like Eggman walking around with a half shit in his pants. Sonic characters aren't quite fit for regular old human anatomy, so it can look really out of place. And another thing... This time, as well as the oh, chaos I call on you to destroy these pests! Now, granted, I hear this is mainly a problem in the GameCube and HD ports of a game, but, well, it's not like anybody's playing the Dreamcast version in 2019. Actually, there are plenty of better aspects about the Dreamcast cutscenes, but somebody else already did a video on that. Anyway, these cutscenes are pretty dated, however, like SA1, I don't think they ruin the story SA2 is trying to tell. Also, like SA1, I can't recall many platformers at the time which even attempted such a story. By the end of 2001, we'd see Jack and Daxter, The Precursor Legacy, Devil May Cry, and Halo Combat evolved, just to name a few. The former of which really pushed video game animation to the next level, with the latter two not quite reaching that but still presenting evolution for in-game cinematography. What I'm getting at is that the standard hadn't really been set in yet for these cutscenes to be considered horrible at the time, hence people met the story fondly. Oh yeah, another thing people tend to complain about is that the characters cut one another off. I mentioned it briefly with the Sonic vs. Shadow cutscene. The real reason for this is that the English clips will sometimes go on too long and overlap one another, however, I guess this may sound a little little dumb, but I never took issue with it. I figured that people tend to interrupt each other in the real world, so that was just a natural element to these cutscenes. <laughs> Whoops. Also, sometimes it actually does happen in Japanese. <laughs> You know, while we're on the topic, the voice acting is also a decent bit better now. Recurring actors like Ryan Drummond, Dean Bristow, and Jennifer Dwaylard feel a lot more natural and seem to be really fit for the roles they're playing, while new actors also bring a nice range of emotion to the picture. Scott, uh, Dreyer is particularly my favorite voice for Knuckles because he emphasizes the calm and collected but also really serious aspect of the character better than anyone else, although he can sound a tad mumbly thanks to the game's sound issues. Long time no see, treasure hunter. 
Did you find my emerald? That's a good one. Your emerald? Talking to you is a waste of time. Tails is now voiced by Connor Bringus, the brother of his actor from SA1. He's better, but he always sounds like he's reading from a script. And for the new characters, David Humphrey is still the best shadow voice for reasons I'll show later, while Lonnie Manella makes a fine, sassy, but professional rouge. The acting isn't superb, there are plenty of takes that I'd probably issue a redo for. I hate you! You guys always leave me behind and have all the but for conveying the feeling the game was meant to give, I think it does a swell job. No problem. We can find it. Right, Knuckles? What? Why do I have to find the key? We're counting on you, buddy. The world's greatest treasure hunter. Anywho, now that I've used my patented YouTube laugh at the cutscenes card, let's get back to the actual content. Sonic, Tails, and Amy land safely on the space colony while Knuckles goes off to recollect the Master Emerald. Tails does a bit of research and reveals that the space colony actually isn't some kind of new death egg, but rather an abandoned research facility from over 50 years ago called Ark. If that's the case, it makes you wonder why it seems to be built with Eggman's face on it. Hmm. Then, Tails shows that he's created a near-identical fake Chaos Emerald that they can use to sabotage Eggman's cannon. This is like, what, the third time Tails has done something incredibly game-changing in this story? Seriously, after proving how competent he could be in the last game, Tails is practically leading the operation in Adventure 2. But of course, not at the expense of our main hero. Sonic and Tails once again go on a coordinated mission to shut off a machine's power supply and switch the Chaos Emeralds, while Amy gets left behind again. Wah, wah, wah. Meanwhile, Knuckles goes to probably my favorite treasure hunting stage in the game. It's by far the largest stage yet, but I don't feel that it's too difficult to get through because, again, rockets are there to easily get you where you want to go. I love the high jumping, the giant dive you can do from the top, the numerous containment areas you can explore, and the sense of gliding over this giant hunk of space. The inherent speed of Knuckles makes a really big level like this fun to navigate. Then you get a battle with Rouge, and uh, if you don't know that you can cheese it like this, it's an alright battle, although it can be a a little disorienting for new players, I'm sure. After this, Knuckles and Rouge bicker at one another for a bit, and then Rouge uh, trips and almost falls into the lava, even though she can fly. I like to headcanon that she faked it so that Knuckles would save her, but I guess that's just me excusing weird plot devices. In a sense of reluctant gratitude, Rouge gives Knuckles her Master Emerald pieces, and it's finally restored. The two seemingly have an intimate respect for one another, and this is a really good moment for Knuckles as a character. One thing I really like about Sonic Adventure 2 is the dynamic between our heroes and villains. Every recurring character is challenged in some new, interesting way by their opponent. We'll see more of that in a bit for Sonic and Tails, but in Knuckles' case, he's been rivaled by someone who's equally as powerful and resourceful. And given that he's spent his entire life alone, only recently making some friends, the fact that he has to deal with a thieving woman is something of note. For Knuckles to feel infatuation towards someone who simultaneously drives him bonkers opens up a serious and focused his shell he normally exhibits. Knuckles becomes a bit of an easier going person as he interacts with Rouge in later games, and I think it's a cool dimension to add to the character. Back to the main group, Tails paves an entrance for Sonic, but then an unexpected event occurs. Okay, Sonic! Now put that emerald! Tails! Tell Sonic to meet you back at the research facility! Sorry! Now. Oh, god damn it. Amy's wandering around got her kidnapped. Why is she even here? Despite her whole I'm gonna be a stronger person speech in the last game, she is a constant liability in Sonic Adventure 2. It's really odd considering that everybody else is participating even more than they did previously. By the way, I love the story recaps in this game. It adds yet another layer to the characters as they give some pretty interesting thoughts on whatever's going on. I'm Sonic! Sonic the Hedgehog! Our plan was perfect! Until Eggman snatched Amy. Eggman said he'll trade us Amy for the Emerald. I have to think about that one. Crazy Gadget is probably the worst Sonic level. You get pelted by artificial chaos tentacles that most people can't possibly dodge, the camera can have a bit of a difficult time adjusting to your rapid turns, and the anti-gravity switches can be quite finicky. Because again, same button syndrome. Alright, almost to the anti- Uh, oh, okay, okay. Uh, we're just gonna bounce up. <sighs> oh, no! Oh, but I like how Eggman taunts you throughout the level. Well done, Sonic, but you'll never leave this room alive! Ha <laughs> ha! 
And now, one of my favorite moments in the entire series. Dr. Eggman holds Amy at gunpoint as Sonic enters with a fake emerald. He menacingly demands that Sonic lay down the emerald if he wants Amy to live, and Tails looks at Sonic as if to say, stick to the plan. I love this look on Sonic's face, knowing that he's about to totally troll Eggman. But instead, what follows is one of the most cleverly written exchanges in the franchise. You've turned into a big time villain, Doctor! <laughs> Whoa. You thought you could trick me with that fake empty, didn't you? So, how did you know it wasn't the real world? Tails! <laughs> because you just told me, Fox Boy. Oh, yes! Wow! In an amazing display of wit, Eggman baits Tails into revealing the fake emerald, causing what appears to be Sonic's demise. As a kid, I mean, it was genuinely emotional when Amy was bawling her eyes out as Eggman somberly bids his arch enemy a good farewell. Then, the completely shook Tails acts upon Sonic's final wish and battles Eggman one last time. Now that was a scene. Everything from the facial expressions to the camera work to the intensity of a music, I still regard it so fondly. And the game follows up with a completely mindless boss fight. Yeah, you're supposed to juke around Eggman and shoot him. It's not necessarily easy nor hard, you just kind of do it and hope you win. How lame. Something I glossed over, however, is that just before Sonic's capsule exploded, he remembered the fake emerald could function as a real one, albeit less powerful. So to escape death, Sonic uses Chaos Control, which he learned from watching Shadow do it at the beginning of a game. He just barely pulls it off, and people do not seem to buy this. How could Sonic pull off an advanced technique his first try using an emerald that's fake? How could he do it just by watching someone else do it once? How, you ask? Well, first, I think it's worth noting that, uh, he's been able to go super using them since 1992. It's not exactly like he doesn't know the first thing about Chaos Emeralds. Secondly, and you could call this contrived, but the Emeralds are miracle gems. So, if one were to focus all their mental energy while on the brink of death, I don't see how it's implausible to be done. That's just my guess. I don't see how it's much more of an ass pull than Gamma being able to regain feelings upon seeing their family. It's fiction. It doesn't ruin the plot. Anywho, Sonic just happens to pop up near Knuckles, and with an exhausted final effort, he rushes to the cannon to put an end to Eggman's scheme once and for all. Final rush. This is a great final level. Primarily, you're grinding over the large bottomless pit of space. These rails extend so long, though, that you're able to get some really big momentum and airtime. There are tons of alternate paths that skilled players can use to increase their rank, plenty of jumps to make, and of course, a section at the end where you run down a building from falling debris. That was cool! Then you get this awesome scene where Sonic is intercepted by Shadow, who is amazed that he managed to pull off Chaos Control. The two gradually pick up speed more and more, and as they do that, the music continuously amps up to, frankly, absurd volume levels. What you see is what you get. Just a guy that loves adventure. I'm Sonic the Hedgehog! I see. But you know, I can't let you live. Your adventure days are coming to an end. At last, Sonic and Shadow know that their victory will decide the world's fate, and we have our final duel. The second fight against Shadow is much better than the first, and the music is fittingly intense and climactic. You can attack him normally, but eventually he'll start to deflect everything you do. Then it's a matter of mind games. You gotta keep a good distance and wait for him to try attacking you before quickly striking. First time players will probably find the fight a little difficult, but I think as the final boss, that's quite alright. If you have skill, timing, and a good handle of Sonic's abilities, you can make very quick work of Shadow. Once you finally prove who the superior hedgehog is, Sonic surprises Tails and Amy by triumphantly foiling Dr. Eggman's plan a mere minute before the cannon would be ready to fire again. Yeah! And that is the end of a hero story. I love it. While it is a little unfortunate that we lost hub worlds and self-contained character stories, the flow presented in Sonic Adventure 2 makes it all worth it to me. My major problem with Sonic Adventure was the fact that Sonic's story has significantly more time put into it and joy to be had than the other playthroughs. Sonic Adventure 2 treats the main gameplay styles with equal focus, creating a more complete experience. I find that all three of the carried over gameplay mechanics have been fine-tuned to feel fun on their own merits, and when they aren't fun, it's the fault 
fault of the level that I'm playing and not the entire component. I also really enjoy the way the story has amped up from before, and we've only seen one side of it. Not only is the tension grander than ever, but our heroes are all pushed to the absolute limit in what was the 10 year anniversary. Sonic nearly dies and fights his most dangerous opponent yet, unearthing new abilities while doing so. Tails is constantly in a battle of tactics with Dr. Eggman, the same person who he feared in the previous game. And Knuckles gets a bit of that bat titty. Uh, I mean, uh, Knuckles also meets somebody of equal strength and is finally able to work together with his new friends. There are some very silly moments, like uh, the entire premise of a military mistaking this guy for this guy, but it doesn't change the core entertainment value. It doesn't make what feels like an epic action movie into something that doesn't make sense or something uninteresting, but I'm getting a wee bit excited. Sonic has always been about being cool, about action, and about being next level, and that is what I get out of just the hero story of Sonic Adventure 2. I know the video's gone on quite a bit, but I still have a lot to add on a dark story, the large list of things to do, the incredible music, the multiplayer, and so I hope you'll stick with me a bit, because now... Eggman steals the research from a military base located on an island to the south. The military's top secret weapon, Shadow. Sealed in the space colony park, the Seven Chaos Emerald. When all of the keys have been collected, world conquest will be at hand. Sonic Adventure 2, The Dark Side Story. Long live the Eggman Empire. Yeah. Um. That. If you pick the dark side first, you'll actually get to see how the story begins, with who's gonna win, knowing the danger lies with God, sorry. Dr. Eggman has apparently gotten a hold of his grandfather's diary, which claims the military is holding a top secret weapon. Naturally, your first dark level is Iron Gate, where you finally get to play as Dr. Eggman and raid Prison Island. In Sonic Adventure 2, the story is very much our two sides of the same coin. Tails climbs upward through Prison Lane to break Sonic out of jail. Eggman reaches down through Iron Gate to retrieve Shadow. In the city, Sonic escapes the military in broad daylight. Shadow attacks the military at nighttime. Knuckles rides the wind of Wild Canyon. Rouge dives into the water of Dry Lagoon. One can see it as lazy, but I find it very charming. And besides, level counterparts still contain their own set pieces that make them worth playing. Eggman gets to the core of Prison Island and awakens Shadow, who says he will grant Eggman one wish. No, that does not mean he's a genie, you simple t What Shadow means by this is unclear, so he instructs Eggman to meet him on the Space Colony Ark. Ark. Eggman retreats back to his base after failing to get the Master Emerald from Knuckles and Rouge, only to find that the military is swarming the place with robots. After you break through those baddies, Eggman decides to see what Shadow's up to, and the moment he turns on his computer, Shadow pops up on the news, apparently having stolen a Chaos Emerald from the bank. I like how Eggman scratches his ass as he watches TV. Very grim, dark storytelling, right guys? <laughs> anyway, Shadow is up against the police as we see a flashback of him running with this girl named Maria, who then sends him to Earth using the capsule that Eggman later uses to kill Sonic. Shadow interprets this memory in the iconic way we know. For the people of this planet, I promise you. Revenge! Then you go to his first stage, Radical Highway, where you grind down the Golden Gate Bridge, dodge airstrikes, roll under construction, and bounce around buildings. Easily the second most memorable level of a game. But it turns out that Rouge had set a tracker on Eggman and followed him to his pyramid base. Thus, we get Eggquarters. Apparently she's also in contact with somebody else. It's worth mentioning that this level is pretty similar to Death Chamber, however, it isn't as tedious because there's no giant center room, hourglass doors, or walls to dig through. No, the gimmick of this level is that Rouge is looking for three keys to enter Eggman's computer room. However, you also need to avoid the security beetle flying around. You can either try and run away before it can see you, or Rouge can hide in the shadows. It's not too menacing, if you get caught you just take damage, but it's unique nonetheless. It turns out that Eggman's computer can actually function as a teleporter, and so Rouge follows him up to the Ark, claiming it's her mission to see what he's up to. I promise, this is where the story gets a bit more interesting. Dr. Eggman makes his way through the completely deserted, although oddly military in forest colony, and finds Shadow in the central control room. And this, once again, is a very quotable scene. Something about the grandiose way everybody pronounces their lines, the way the camera zooms in on Shadow's face as he says, The world could be yours. It's amazing. So yeah, Shadow reveals that Professor Jail Robotnik created not only him, but also the ultimate weapon, codenamed the Eclipse Cannon. 
However, to reactivate it, he and Eggman need to gather the seven Chaos Emeralds. Once they do this, they will have unlimited power against anyone who dares oppose them. Now, this begs a lot of questions, even by Eggman himself. His grandpa, Gerald Robotnik, created a space colony arc and was funded by the military to continue his research there for the betterment of mankind. However, as Eggman stated at the beginning of the game, it was shut down because Gunn feared it. So what made that happen? What about Shadow or the Eclipse Cannon were supposed to benefit humanity in the first place? The plot thickens. Just then, Rouge jumps in and declares that she has a deal to make with Eggman. A uh, deal? If he gives her his Emerald Radar, she will assist him in collecting the Chaos Emeralds. I like this part where she bribes him with the blue Emerald and he's like, oh shit, she got me, and then Shadow's like, yeah, she did. Uh, anyway. So our villains head back to Prison Island and Eggman is understandably skeptical about Rouge taking him back here. So to make sure Rouge isn't setting him up to be arrested, this is where Eggman has Shadow set dynamite packs to blow up the whole island in 30 minutes. I love this portion of a game. The unapologetic destruction that is Weapons Bed, the tense, kinda stupid, but not impossible to beat time limit of Security Hall, and the epic rush through White Jungle. It really feels like some tactical mission that only has one shot at being pulled off. You have Eggman fighting Tails, Rouge gets locked in a safe and fights a third, more difficult rendition of Bigfoot, and to top it off, Shadow fights Sonic. Now, Shadow seems to have some mental parallel between Maria and Rouge, so he goes and saves her, but convinces himself that it was just for the Chaos Emeralds. I really could care less about her. It's the Chaos Emeralds I have to save. Right. And so he uses Chaos Control to save her a mere second before the island blows up. Memorable. Action. Set piece. It, you get the idea. Back on the arc, we see a more peaceful flashback of Shadow and Maria. This time, the two are looking down at Earth, apparently never having been there, wondering what it's like. Shadow is shown to basically be kind of a newborn, not really knowing why he was created. But what Shadow does know is that Professor Gerald works to ensure peace for all mankind. He wants to visit Earth to find his purpose, ironically bringing us to now where he's, well, he's definitely found a purpose. You know, I didn't come to save you. I came back for the Chaos Emeralds. Yeah, yeah, but then again, that's not the whole story, is it? Everything is ready to go! <laughs> I, I love the relationship between these three. This is the part where Eggman blows the moon in half, right? While in the hero story it's this big deal, our heroes are kind of afraid, this is what happens in the dark story directly after this shocking event. Why are you so upset? Well, that was really impressive. You've managed to create complete havoc on the whole planet. Does this now mean we control the planet and can do as we choose? At this rate, the cannon will take too much time to charge up. If you want to unleash its full potential, you'll need all seven Chaos Emeralds. Where in the world have you been? Something happened? Our threats fell on deaf ears. Look at you, throwing a tantrum like a little kid. How totally embarrassing. Ah, oh, it's brilliant. I love how the hero side is all about teamwork, how great it is that friends will have your back. But the entire dark story has Eggman and Rouge bickering while Shadow just doesn't give a shit and tries to get his job done. Anyway, Rouge pulls up a newspaper that says Tails got a Chaos Emerald after Sonic Adventure 1 as a reward for saving Station Square. So then you get a dark version of a cart level, which fittingly is a bit more difficult because it's later in the plot than it was for the heroes. Adventure 2 is pretty good at difficulty balancing. It's comforting that the level I don't really like happen to be at the end, where it at least makes sense that they'd be harder to beat. Speaking of the endgame, let's go there. After the heroes manage to escape Eggman's pyramid ambush, the doctor informs Rouge that they're on the way to the Ark. However, Rouge takes this opportunity to trick him into giving her the Ark's computer password. She then goes snooping around into information about Shadow, and once she finds some really alarming news, she stops everything to go steal the Master Emerald pieces that flew out of a shuttle. Ugh. Oh my god, it's Mad Space. I said that Death Chamber was the worst level in the game, and trust me, that wasn't only for the hero story. Most people liked Mad Space of that title, and I can see why. The incredibly finicky anti-gravity can make planetary exploration a chore, and the hints are actually very different this time. For Rouge's final level, they decide to write the first hint in reverse, and subsequent hints will actually be direct lies that the player must do the opposite of. I think Omochao tells you about this, but you can't assume the player will always want to talk to him. No, most players will instead deliberately avoid him, throw him off cliffs, or send him into the cold vacuum of space. Again. And again. 
Ah, I love this game. Mad Space has the scope of Meteor Herd, but it's made just a little more obtuse to the point where it's not fun. But you know what is fun? If you press the A button while cutscenes are playing in the Dreamcast or HD versions of a game, Big the Cat will appear. Whoa! You can also find Big within the levels, too. The many, many Easter eggs of Sonic Adventure 2, I can't really shake the feeling that they had a lot of fun making the game. Back in the pyramid base, Eggman detects that strangely the heroes have two Chaos Emeralds. This leads him to deduce that they're going to trick him with a fake emerald, meaning, yes, Eggman knew during this entire scene what was going on, and he baited Tails into telling him anyway because he's just that much of an evil dick. Ooh! But before that, we have this incredible moment. Wait, Shadow! I'm the one who should be telling them the end is near, not you! Now is the time to end this long drawn out battle. It's in history as the ultimate genius. If something happens today, I'm counting on you to finish the job. Hurry, right, the moment for attack has come. It's now or never. Again. 10th anniversary, the final game on the Dreamcast. This was the climax of everything that's happened in the series so far. Dr. Eggman is finally on the cusp of victory as he goes through easily the best mech level in the game, and then sends Sonic hurtling to his doom. Not to mention that he has enough respect and trust in Shadow that if anything happens, he'll take care of it. Definitely beats the previous partnerships. So back to that scene where Sonic theoretically dies. This is what Eggman says after ending this long battle with his arch enemy. Farewell, Sonic, my admirable adversary. And this is what Eggman was actually thinking. I'm Dr. Eggman, the greatest scientific genius of the world. <laughs> I finally did it! I've defeated Sonic! That annoying hedgehog is now gone forever! He's nothing but floating chunks in space now. What are you going to do now, Tails? If you are against me, you'll suffer the same fate as your buddy, Sonic. By far, this is the character's best appearance. So yeah, I think that about does it for how good the recurring characters have been treated, but how about our new characters? While everybody else is distracted, Rouge decides to take the six Chaos Emeralds and book it. But then Shadow arrives having learned that Rouge is actually a government spy. Ladies and gentlemen, we've done it. It took a long time for me to utter the word, but we found our first, say it with me now, plot hole. Now, I'm sure you're gonna bring up Gun mistaking Sonic for Shadow, or <sighs> Eggman having a rocket when he already has a space teleporter, but to understand why these are not plot holes, I'm gonna do a quick Google search. Plot hole, an inconsistency in the narrative or character development of a book, film, television show, etc an inconsistency. Well, there's nothing quite inconsistent with the government being colorblind, that's just dumb writing. Now here's an inconsistency. If Gunn was in cahoots with Rouge the whole time, then how come they didn't just give her the Chaos Emeralds when she went to Prison Island? Now perhaps her secret agent status was only granted by the president under wraps, and so other factions wouldn't know about it. But then if that's true, why did Rouge assist Eggman in blowing up the island? Did she get in trouble for it? No, and that makes no sense. Unless we're to believe that the president was willing to let an entire island of people and equipment go just for Rouge to keep her cover. Actually, maybe that's not out of the equation, but I don't really buy it. Rouge never remotely talks about any of it, and it just comes off as a way for them to hide whose side she's really on. <clears throat> anyway, it doesn't ruin the plot, but as a bit of a Sonic Adventure 2 connoisseur, I find it really puzzling when people mistake suspension of disbelief for outright plot holes that make the story nonsensical. Frankly, while it does take thinking to fully piece the two stories together, Sonic Adventure 2 is a fairly straightforward narrative, and its holes, whatever you may find, don't make the the plot implode on itself. <sighs> rant over. Back on topic, Rouge reveals that the information she was ordered to discover inferred that Shadow is not actually the ultimate life form. As shown in this report, which you can actually read by the way, it's pretty interesting, the supposed real Shadow is some lizard thingy. Just then, Eggman warns Shadow that somebody's trying to make their way to the cannon, but before Shadow can leave, Rouge hypothesizes that Shadow's memories may not even be real. Shadow insists that even if that's true, he is still himself, he still made a promise, and that's all that matters. Not 
only does this imply that Shadow's memories have been tampered with, causing him to do all these horrible things, but it's a great moment for his character, showing that he values his personal identity and will stop at nothing to make his old friend happy. And while he deems Rouge a pathetic creature, she's still able to make him actually think about what he's doing. Shadow is the first ever villain that in the same game he was introduced in was also playable. Well, okay, maybe you can count Knuckles, but with three-dimensional character motives that couldn't be explored on the Genesis, how could Shadow not make an impact? The same kind of goes for Rouge, being a more neutral figure, literally just doing a job so she can collect her jewels. I can give you two reasons as to why Rouge is a great character. The first being her personality. You can comment on her appealing design all you want, but Rouge also has a very distinct attitude and chemistry of Knuckles, Shadow, and Eggman that immediately make her a popular addition to the cast. Despite them being brand new characters, I feel like Shadow and Rouge fit right in with the ever four that we've known since the 16-bit era. And that is why the whole hero and dark thing can work so well. It's why the whole story can work, because the six characters really are a driving force for a much greater conflict. So to wrap things up here, Shadow goes through final chase and has the last boss fight with Sonic. I like to think that he canonically won on account of the fact that he's literally more powerful than Sonic in every way, but anywho. When he beat the hero story, Sonic blows up the cannon, but Eggman seems to get away with the real emerald. In the dark story, Shadow stops Sonic from taking out the cannon, and Eggman defeats Tails as well, finally emerging victorious with all seven Chaos Emeralds. But not without a warning before he fires the cannon. Huh. Now, I have gone through both sides in Sonic Adventure 2. I tell you how great the dark story is, but, well, I think I've already done that. Simply, I think the gameplay is just as fun as the hero side while also having its own levels and boss fights to make it worth playing. Just like Sonic Adventure, I love the differing perspectives. Without the game emphasizes time till the Eclipse Cannon fires, it's really cool to see how everything plays out in relation. But like this part in the hero story where after Sonic and Tails invade the president's limo, the secretary gets a call from an agent. It has no bearing on the hero plot whatsoever. But in the dark story, directly after Eggman throws a tantrum, this happens. This makes things a whole lot easier. Hurry, go back to work and find them fast. I want that Chaos Emerald. Did you get that? And then Rouge proceeds to inform the president that she's looking into Shadow. There are no adventure fields and no differences in character delivery, but I feel that the world of Sonic Adventure 2 is just as ambitious and the story even more so. Attention to detail at every turn, character monologues that reveal interesting trivia, continuity from SA1 with things like Tails' ownership of a Chaos Emerald, or the fact that Gerald Robotnik developed artificial chaos. As an experience, I think Sonic Adventure 2 carries and improves the adventure spirit masterfully, even with its major gameplay changes. I don't have much else to add on a dark story and how it differs from a hero story since they're both on the same level of quality, but there is one thing about it in particular that I should note. I mentioned that Tails was included in mech format because the game needed a rival to Dr. Eggman. However, the truth is that this also appears to apply to Shadow and Rouge. After the E3 2000 announcement trailer only showed Sonic, Knuckles, and Dr. Eggman, fans were excited, although soon, there was outcry at the thought of Tails not being a playable character. <laughs> ironic. To top it off, the new mysterious Ultimate Hedgehog was also not shown to be playable. When interviewed, Yuji Naka would give numerous different answers on the whereabouts of Tails, and it seemed to lead to the idea that he was part of a story, but not not playable. Pre-release contains material of Sonic and Skyrail, which as we all know, is a shadow level in the final game. But at last, Tails, Shadow, and Rouge were all shown to be playable a mere two months before the game was to come out, almost an entire year after the game was announced. Indeed, in less than a year's time, the game must have been drastically altered to include these three characters, and thus, creating the hero and dark scenario we know today. In the final game, there are six stages for Sonic, and four for Shadow, five stages for Knuckles and Eggman, four stages for Rouge and Tails. Well, if you don't count the cart levels. And you know, I really admire this about Sonic Adventure 2. The Sonic franchise is infamous for rushed games, and Sonic Adventure 2 was apparently one of them. However, the fact that they could seamlessly integrate clone characters and have the story work perfectly around it, all in just a year's time because fans wanted Tails to be playable again, I have nothing but respect for having managed to pull this off as well as they did. And while I would love to see the hypothetical game where we have a Sonic story, a Knuckles story, and an Eggman story, I think it worked out for the better that you got to know characters like Shadow and Rouge through gameplay. I don't give a shit that Tails is in a mech because, well, as dumb as it sounds, I still felt like I was Tails, only now using his inventions. On a gameplay merit, I've heard some say that even if you were to enjoy the other characters, wouldn't it just be better if it were only Sonic and Shadow? Honestly, no. I would rather have a gameplay variety and character involvement that we have now, because that is just the experience Sonic Adventure 2 set out to achieve. From its inception, Sonic Adventure 2 was all about opposites. The 
balance of good and evil, past and present, other shit like that. And I feel that the final structure for the game emphasizes that trait really well. I don't think it would have had the same effect otherwise. Despite the, no doubt, large restructure of the game since its reveal, Sonic Adventure 2 feels like a complete package that was able to realize everything it wanted to accomplish. And that includes... Optional content. No Sonic game is able to match the sheer amount of content available in SA2. Okay, content that actually matters. On top of over 30 levels to play, there are four extra missions for each one. There are also cart races, boss rushes, and oh yes, the Chow Garden. But to get every emblem, you also need to A rank every mission, and this makes 100%ing Adventure 2 a very big task. Now, I've said my piece as to how rankings enhance general gameplay by making the player feel more active, but to perfect the entire game is truly daunting. Most of the time, it's pretty fine. If you can A rank the stage normally, then you can probably probably do its missions too, but there are moments that can really test my patience. Beating a mission is pretty simple, A ranking a mission is where the real challenge lies. I kinda like it, but I also understand that maybe proving you could beat a harder challenge in its own right would have been fine enough for most people. In every level, the second mission is to collect 100 rings. For our speed characters, it's easy, but Tails and Eggman will have a hard time because enemies can just fly in and quickscope you. A rank, gone. Knuckles and Rouge have to kinda scour the earth for rings, so it's a bit of a challenge for them as well. Mission 3s, though, I really like. Every character can find the Mystic Melody, which will allow them to play some kind of energy flute at these tiny Mystic Ruin Shrines. Your goal will be to find the Lost Chow. This prompts you to explore the level in search of the Mystic Ruin Shrine, which will then lead you to the Little Onion Boy. Some of these are hidden in pretty clever little locations, and I think it's really fun looking for them. And again, good decision on Sonic Team. Getting an A rank on Mission 2 and 3 only requires that you do it fast, because it wouldn't make sense to do random tricks in a mission where you gather rings. Mission 4? is quite simple. Do the level under a time limit, but for an A rank, put a little flair into it. And for Mission 5, they actually design a hard mode for each level. For the speed and mech characters, these are really fun. I've played the game enough to where the normal stages are pretty easy, so these are really welcome. It throws off my muscle memory every time. But for Knuckles and Rouge, oh, these missions suck. The emeralds aren't randomized, but trying to find them is equivalent to a needle in a haystack, and the hints don't always help either. What the fuck? How do I get this emerald? Oh, I see. I just gotta stand on this platform and use my sunglasses upgrade to find an invisible spring. Yeah, there's a lot of that kind of shit in these missions. I have wandered levels for what felt like an eternity looking for these. It's, well, it's brain tingling, but more often than not, I just want out. Well, at least the A rank is easy once you've already found them all. Oh yeah, also the cart levels have their own missions, which include not hitting the cars and not hitting the walls. I think these are really easy, but I figured I would mention it because they're a little infamous to newer players. But how about that Chow Garden? To get all emblems in Sonic Adventure 2, you'll need to raise Chow so they can compete in races, and if you're playing Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, Chow Karate? Oh my god! Raising a Chow is already more fun now because you don't need to run back and forth across a map to do it. No, in this game all you gotta do is find one of three Chow boxes in a level and then your character will be warped at the end of a stage. After that, you can just revisit it on the world map anytime. Actually, there are many quality of life changes to the Chow Garden, at least compared to Sonic Adventure DX. Again, I can't really speak on the originals. Have you ever wanted to increase your Chow stats, but you hate how the animal parts look on them? Well, gun robots and artificial chaos are powered by chaos drives. These techno crayon thingies will increase a single step for a chow, although it may not be as powerful as an animal's stat boost. Explorative players will find that every level has its own set of animals and chow boxes hidden away, including cool new legendary animals like a like a dragon or a phoenix, yeah. In Sonic Adventure DX, if you wanted to buy something, you could only buy one. In Adventure 2 Battle, you can hold up to five. Thank you, game. Oh, I guess there's also just the chow kindergarten in general. Here you can learn more about how to raise chow, you can see your chow stats in greater detail, you can have this idiot give your chow a stupid name, or do it yourself, and you can drop your chow off in school to give him cute little abilities. Oh, but by far the biggest innovation Sonic Adventure 2 made to the chow garden is morality. Depending on which character you raise chow with, they will lean towards a certain allegiance. If you decide to mix it up, they'll be neutral. Thus, you get a hero and dark, oh, good lord, you know, for kids. You can also abuse chow with a hero or dark character, making them go to the opposite alignment, but you're not going to see footage of me doing that. I would rather have chow out of a hedgehog take a break from mass genocide so he can pet baby chow. Hmm. 
Chao races are a lot better this time around as well, for two reasons. One, if I know I'm gonna lose, I don't have to wait there for it to fucking happen. Two, in this game, your Chao has a stamina bar, which means you can press the A button to give him a little boost. In Sonic Adventure 1, you needed to, like, hope your Chao sparkled, and then press the A button to make it go faster, and this was never very clear. Your Chao still needs to be really proficient to beat all the races, and they added a lot more of them, but now there's a little bit more control over the outcome. But ooh, Chao Karate, this... Well, while it's really amusing and cute, but it too is very simple. Just press the A button when their zeal is running low, and yeah, hope they win. Once you beat a select amount of Chao races, you unlock little toys for them to play with. It's so precious. I love the Chao Garden. It's not really the reason I play the game, but again, I appreciate that I have this entire sub-game to play for. I have hours and hours of playtime, and this is just a bonus on top of that. This game is packed to the brim of cool shit. Look at how Eggman runs around the room. Look at him! But alright, no more stalling. What do you get upon scoring those final emblems. What does this giant Sonic game reward you with for completing everything you get? No. No. No, I, I, I did not just spend all of that time complete the entire game just, just, just to play the same goddamn level I've played over and over again. Well, no current day, Jeb. There's something different about this one. At the time, this was really special. For the 10th anniversary of Sonic the Hedgehog, your grand reward for completing the entire game is a full 3D reimagining of a classic zone that started it all, right down to the original level design and badniks being completely recreated. Yeah, the camera kinda sucks, but who cares? At this point, it wasn't a standard anymore for the games to have Green Hill levels. Sonic was expanding, and to some, maybe it was a bit too far past the days of old. But the main point is that Green Hill had never been seen in this way before. It even has the classic sound effects for Sonic Adventure 1 homing attack, I, I can't get mad at this, this is awesome. And again, in 2001, or hell, even when I first played the game in 2005, I would have shit my pants. But like Sonic Adventure DX, there's more to collect throughout the game than just your final reward. Alternate menu themes, you get Amy, Omochao, Maria, and you can do a secret input to get uh, the United Federation Secretary? E yeah, okay. You can also unlock alternate vehicles and characters for the kart racing. Like, oh wow, Egg Robo. And by A-ranking a character's stages, you get alternate multiplayer costumes. Oh, multiplayer! Yeah, Sonic Adventure 2 can have two players battle it out in just about every gameplay capacity you would hope for. Action races, mech shooting, treasure hunting, kart racing, chow racing, chow karate, everything. It features exclusive characters like Metal Sonic, a chow walker, and even chaos. Ugh, I really wish you could unlock these characters in single player though, I don't see why not. On top of trimmed down story levels, multiplayer also has unique stages too, explicitly made for two player battles. The chow multiplayer is more of a GameCube and Dreamcast kind of thing, the idea is that you take your memory card to your friend's house and like pit your chow against them. It doesn't really hold the same charm in the HD version where there are no memory cards or GBA games, but yeah. It's kind of the same deal for me as Ratchet Deadlock, where it ain't Halo or Mario Party, but man, I love that they took the time to add multiplayer to begin with. Good multiplayer. No other platformer in the series even came close to Sonic Adventure 2's battle mode, and it wasn't a waste of development because everything else felt complete regardless of my opinion on whatever it may be. My only gripe with two players is that once you unlock the alternate costumes, they actually come with new abilities too. Alright, in multiplayer, if you collect rings, you can use special attacks to beat your opponent. Characters all have slight differences from one another in this regard. For example, Amy may not have a spin dash or light speed, but she can spam abilities like a little bitch. Metal Sonic can't use special attacks at all, but in exchange, he moves insanely fast. Sonic and Shadow are balanced, but when they have their new racing suits, good luck beating Sonic. While Shadow gets to use a 5 second chaos control every 20 rings, Sonic gets to use Sonic Wind. It sounds balanced, but what actually happens is that this version of Sonic Wind will not only hit the opponent and knock them back, but it will also take away their control for a few seconds, meaning that it's practically an upgrade to Shadow's measly chaos control, giving this version of Sonic a blatant advantage over his regular self, ergo making him the ideal speed character. This also applies to Knuckles, and Tails' Mach Speed Tornado 1 mech can pretty much break the game as well.
All right, all right. I've had my fill. I'm a load of content this game has. I think compared to the admirable but somewhat clumsy post-game of Sonic Adventure, this is a major improvement. Tons of legitimate challenges, tons of cool things to unlock, a satisfactory multiplayer, a chow garden that, whatever you think of it, has people coming back to this game just to play it alone. What more could I even ask? But what makes it all just that much better is the soundtrack. To many, I'm going to sound like a total dunce, but this is, without a doubt, one of the greatest video games soundtracks I've heard in my life. That is no hyperbole. You'll not believe how hard it was to go this entire script without just taking a break to gush about the music. Even then, I think I've let it leak out a few times. Just a few. Multi-dimensional Sonic Adventure 2 original soundtrack. I like how we're keeping the weird titles here. Fittingly, the cover features literally nothing but the characters. Character, character, character. See, it's all relevant. This soundtrack does something very unique in that it's themed entirely around the protagonists. In Sonic Adventure, I noted that the vocal themes were amazing tracks that felt like music the main cast would legitimately listen to. Sonic Adventure 2, it's that, but for every stage. I mean, alright, the common critique of the OST is that it's mostly rock, but I don't find that to be a bad thing at all because it's just that damn good at what it's aiming to do. It remains varied enough to have a cohesive sound while also being very memorable. Sonic has high energy rock tunes that always keep you moving. Tails follows up by sharing similar taste, but with his own synthesized appeal to it. And Knuckles features the incredibly iconic raps by Hunted P. Dr. Eggman has bitchin' metal pieces with more of a grungy industrial percussion sound. Rouge's music is very jazzy, with beautiful vocals. And Shadow, well, his music kind of alternates between rock and techno, but either way, it fits the artificial life form motif. Outside of some MIDI cutscene arrangements, instrumentation is top tier and the music fits whatever scenario it's placed in. I love the Junsunoi slap bass, the record swipes, the sheer proud energy that this soundtrack emits. The boss music is great, the levels are great, the cutscene music is great, the chow music is great. everything. I remember every single track. And of course, each character has their own theme song to be played in the cutscenes. The heroes all have completely new renditions of their Sonic Adventure 1 themes, and I think they're just as great, if not better. It doesn't The dark side has completely new vocal themes though, boasting the classic that is Dr. Eggman's theme.
Again, I love this shit. Nothing makes a character stand out more than when they have an incredible theme to accompany their entrance. I must reiterate, the theme music is probably a huge factor in why people remember scenes like this. There's a reason Shadow left a greater impact than Metal Sonic, but I digress. The Sonic Adventure 2 soundtrack once again raises the bar that Sonic music attains, featuring plenty of vocal tracks, tons of artists, a unique character-based identity, and, well, I just think it sounds good. It's one of the many shining examples in Sega's repertoire of music, and I think it's safe to assume that the franchise wouldn't be the same without it. Well, I think that about does it. I've gone through just about every square inch of this game that I feel like talking about, and there's so much more out there. But, because I value my lovely audience, I think it's finally time to talk about The Last Story. Shadow. The ultimate life form. End of Chaos control. Space Desperation. Super Sonic. Collision. Untamed power. Maria. Chaos Emeralds. Professor Crisis. Gerald the truth Absorption. about 50 the years ago. Everything. Sonic Adventure 2. Last episode. Wishes are eternal. So regardless of who won the final battle, Eggman still makes off with the final Chaos Emerald and attempts to fire the cannon. I guess he was pretty serious about that 24 hour time limit. However, just as he does so, a projection of the man, the myth, the legend himself, Gerald Dobotnik shows up and plays around the entire world, promising revenge upon all of humanity for taking everything away from him. By gathering all Chaos Emeralds and activating the Eclipse Cannon, it actually triggers a program that will make the entire Ark fall to Earth and destroy it. Rouge gets a call from the President and, hey, wait a minute. Why didn't she take the emeralds? That was what she was here the entire time to do. What, did she really get scared that Shadow would kill her if she did? It's not like she was off doing anything, she was just sitting around after Shadow went to go stop Sonic. One job. You had one. Anywho, everybody shows up and watches the final message from Professor Gerald before he was put up against a firing squad. Oh. Then Eggman arrives and shows the contents of his grandfather's diary. Here, the truth is revealed. <clears throat> Fifty years ago, the military arrived on the Ark to stop Professor Gerald's research out of fear that it could be used against them. They put the professor into custody and killed everyone on board, including Gerald's granddaughter, Dr. Eggman's cousin, Maria Robotnik. During the raid, Shadow was sent to Earth by Maria, and later was retrieved by gun. Under military confinement, the professor was forced to continue his research, and the Ark was shut down, the story they released to the public being that there had been an accident. Gerald learned that Maria died on the Ark and went insane, only wanting everything to end. Because of this, he designed Shadow's mind to be, and I quote, perfect, pure. And if anyone wanted to fill the world with destruction, they should release Shadow from his captivity. What he didn't say in his journal was that Shadow would enact his master program to, uh, literally destroy the planet. So this obviously raises some more questions. How much did Eggman know Maria? How did Gerald program the Ark to fall to Earth if he was in prison? Why didn't the military just destroy Shadow and the Ark? Okay, well the answer to that one is probably because they wanted to use the research, but anyway, it's all very vague and certainly deeper than any story thus far. None of it's super complicated to where I can't understand anything, but it's quite a bit more unsettling than the story of chaos. The way the camera pans around the room as everyone's kind of disturbed, the creepy music, the delivery of Professor Gerald, I think it hit the mark it wanted to. I found Maria's name among those who died when the Ark was shut down. She meant everything to me, and I couldn't bear the thought that she died because of my research. I lost everything. I had nothing more to live for. I went insane. All I could think about was to avenge her. Somehow, some way. More about Professor Gerald will be shown in later titles, and I think it's pretty cool how he's kind of a landmark in the lore of Sonic the Hedgehog. Now it's clear why Dr. Eggman released Shadow, but ironically, he was totally duped by Shadow and his own grandpa. Dull. So now, for the very first time, Eggman works together with the heroes and leads an operation to stop the colony from crashing into Earth. To do this, they need to reach the core of a colony and use the Master Emerald, which Knuckles can apparently just pull out of his ass, to counteract the energy of the Chaos Emeralds. And thus... Oh yes, one big, epic final level that features everyone but Shadow, and the music will change as you switch gameplay styles. The main gimmick here is that there will be switches which will stop time and allow you to press onward. As such, there are a buttload of obstacles that you need to get through with Eggman and Tails, then you get to play as Knuckles and Rouge in linear, puzzle-like settings. Not gonna lie, I think this is really cool. It shows that they could design point A to point B stages for Knuckles in 3D, and despite my defenses earlier, I think this is an optimal approach, should he return one day. 
Now, if you don't get the air necklace in Aquatic Mine, Knuckles will have to rely on air bubbles, making it a pretty tense journey to the end of the area. Finally, you get to play as Sonic, and what the... Yeah, I guess Professor Gerald was pretty big on ancient echidna culture. Ooh, maybe he designed Shadow off the supersonic mural in Hidden Palace Zone. I mean, why else would he be a hedgehog? Speaking of Shadow, Amy finds him patiently waiting for the end. His job is complete. He's fulfilled Maria's wish, and now he can die in peace. But Amy says, you know what, I'm tired of doing nothing, and she goes to try and convince Shadow, the one who set all this in motion, to help. <sighs> well, this apparently works because, akin to chaos, Shadow learns from Amy that not everyone on Earth is a complete douchebag. This triggers his real memory of Maria, showing that what she wanted all along, despite the selfishness of those who killed her, was for Shadow to bring peace to all mankind. Again, if you happen to miss the two instances where it's implied that Gerald altered Shadow's memory, the fact still remains that he had interpreted a friend's dying wish the wrong way and genuinely thought that what he was doing was right, especially since he's never even been to Earth before to know whether or not this is true. It's a detail of his character that's been absent from so many games, this kind of fragility in his mind. Yes, he's willing to go to extreme measures, do things by any means necessary, all that, but at his core, Shadow isn't this heartless dude who doesn't care about anything. When thinking about why he saved Rouge, despite the fact that he was planning on killing everyone anyway, when he sheds a tear upon realizing what he's done wrong, for the time in which he was one, Shadow was easily the most fleshed out villain in the series. But once Amy's sheer kindness breaks through to him, he runs off like oh fuck gotta go and we get shadows portion of the last story a boss fight against the big moose himself the bio lizard wait what yeah this was what we saw on the report earlier the prototype of the ultimate life form this is probably the most difficult boss fight in the game featuring a pretty dynamic range of attacks balls that you got to be quick on the draw to avoid waterways that can carry you to your doom more balls and the bio lizard chasing you from both ends all of this plus a sick boss theme and the feeling of shadow finally being a good guy I mean, I just, I, I just, whew. As Shadow finishes the prototype off, Knuckles ups out the Master Emerald and recites the very same verse that Takal used to call upon it in Sonic Adventure 1. I really like the way the game ties into the original by the end here. The colony stops falling, but then the Bio Lizard goes, Grrr, and Chaos controls out of here. According to Eggman, he is now one with the colony and is going to make sure that it crashes. Although Sonic doesn't really know what changed in his mind, he looks at Shadow with the knowledge that they can stop this together and, uh, uh, okay, Sonic and Shadow take the Chaos Emeralds and... Uh, boom! Super Sonic and Super Shadow. So our final boss is... Oh, oh... Okay, the final hazard. Well, I guess that begins the Monster of the Week quota. Somehow, this battle against a giant lizard of a space colony shoved up its ass manages to be climactic. The inspirational dialogue between our previously opposed protagonists. The fact that you literally have five minutes until the Earth is destroyed, with a screen getting all red and the characters starting to panic as time goes on. And of course, the main theme, Live and Learn, blasting from the speakers the whole way through. <laughs> But anyway, the actual boss fight is pretty alright. The one thing I don't like about it is that these lasers seem to kind of have a mind of their own. It's not really apparent when we're going to juke you and send you flying all the way back. But otherwise, this is a pretty unique final boss fight where you get to freely control the flight of Sonic and Shadow. It's kind of like Doomsday Zone, but in 3D. If you start running out of rings, you can also go over or under the final hazard to switch characters. So even with the increasing amount of lasers and flying eggs, you should always have a way to pull yourself back up. And with that, I think you have a simple and fair final challenge. It's epic, it's fun, it's memorable, and I like it. Did you really think you had a chance? With the orchestral horns increasing in intensity, the mere minutes away from everyone's destruction, Sonic and Shadow fly up to the Space Colony arc and pull off a super duper chaos control together, counteracting the arc's velocity and saving the entire world. However, I guess Shadow was so fueled by his desire to save humanity that he uses up all his chaos energy and he seemingly dies. 
The Ark is teleported back to its rightful position in space. Everyone on Earth celebrates, and the scary little girl has her demons revoked. But Sonic makes his way back to the Ark with only a single inhibitor ring left from Shadow. Rouge expresses concern towards Shadow's whereabouts, but to no avail. The credits begin to roll by as our cast slows down to have a melancholy moment where they talk about the events that just transpired. Sonic and Rouge come to the understanding that Shadow was a hero in the end, regardless of what the professor had in mind. Dr. Eggman just has a normal discussion with Tails about how he looked up to his grandfather and wanted to be a great scientist just like him. He's actually kinda hurt that his hero, his family, tried to kill him. But Tails assures his arch enemy that they're both great scientists who were able to solve this problem together. And for once, they stand in agreement. Knuckles wonders if Rouge will go back to rapidly searching for jewels, but surprisingly, she says no. Instead, she hints that there's something, or someone, else that she feels like pursuing right now. And Knuckles can just happily leave it at that. Finally, Sonic realizes what truly made Shadow the ultimate life form, and... Uh, this ending is one of my favorites. Like, it's the one everybody remembers. People remember the death of Shadow. People remember this calm moment of everyone looking out into space and just talking. The soothing peace in the background, the subdued voice delivery, the fact that we get to see the more human side of all these characters. It's the little details that elevate it above that of previous games. And the final shot Sonic Adventure 2 ends on? It's really great. Almost unparalleled. It's the cherry on top of everything the game accomplishes, and I couldn't have it any other way. Sayonara, Shadow, the Hedgehog. God, my throat hurts. I mean, what do I even say at this point, guys? Sonic Adventure 2, without a doubt in my mind, is the best Sonic game. I know, I know, that is betrayal to say in 2019, but really. If you need to know why I believe this game is better than Sonic 3 & Knuckles, Sonic Generations, Sonic Mania, well, I think the previous hour should suffice. But too long didn't watch, Sonic Adventure 2 tried its damnedest and succeeded in just about every category it needed to. And no, that's not me saying it's perfect, that's me saying that in every area I've found it to matter, Sonic Adventure 2 was fun. And that's what games are about. Fun. It's that simple. There is no other Sonic game out there that is as ambitious or successful with that ambition than this one. Okay, maybe 3 & Knuckles for its time, but Adventure 2 really was that game they wanted to be the ultimate next-gen entry, the game which was so big that even the pinnacle of 2D Sonic had competition. Everything from the great controls, the scope, the destruction, the stylistic appeal, the set pieces, the hours upon hours of things to do, secrets to fine, the number of stages, the bosses, the art, the music, the world, the stakes, the lines which I can quote word for word because the voice actors actually gave a shit about the characters they played. You're pretty persistent for a hedgehog, aren't you? You're still alive, <laughs> Just huh? letting Knuckles pilot the shuttle on the way over here was more dangerous than you could ever be. That is what I care about. I don't care about the fact that Sonic's levels are a tad more linear than they were in Sonic Adventure. I don't care about the fact that Eggman's mech goes beep. And no, I don't even care about the extra minute or two I may spend because of a gimped radar. None of the issues I have mentioned in this ridiculously long video have ever made me quit playing. It never made me dock points for what I thought was a really substantial experience. There isn't another game like it. And you know, to get kind of personal here, Sonic Adventure 2 really was the thing that taught me how games could be something more. Games have gone a long way from a frog jumping across a river or a yellow ball eating ghosts. Games could have stories, big budget music, merits that elevate it above time wasting entertainment. Doing that was what made Sonic Adventure 2 the top performing Sonic game until 2017. Don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying it's high art that only the most sophisticated of video game analysts can understand, I'm more suggesting that it was a platformer which went all out to ensure that it would meet expectations. I guess that Sonic Mania is a much less flawed game, but I'm not really blown away by it. New Super Mario Bros. 2 is a less flawed game, but what about it is interesting. Even one of my ever favorite games ever, the thing I probably regard closest to the word perfect 
perfect, I don't exactly have the same fondness towards because I have such a respect for what this game stands for. In 2001, every little thing had to count for Sonic Adventure 2. Not only was this the 10th anniversary of the mascot franchise, not only did it have to live up to the previously acclaimed Sonic Adventure, not only was there a new competition popping up left and right, but again, it was the final Sonic game on the Dreamcast, which, as we all know, was the final Sega console. The company was on the move to become third party, and once that happens, it's kind of up in the air what'll really become of Sonic, let alone any of Sega's other properties. I mean, obviously the series would continue, but it really was a strange time. When they announced their shift to software in February of that year, they stated that Sonic would be introduced on the Game Boy Advance, but who knew if Sonic would eventually take a radically different direction? Who knew if Sonic would eventually be outright bought by Nintendo, Sony, or even become an exclusive for the Xbox? A floodgate of possibilities was opened, and regardless of if this could be a good thing, Sonic Adventure 2 signified the end of an era. Not for Sonic, but for gaming as a whole. Eventually, Sonic would make his third-party home console debut on the Nintendo GameCube with Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. This version of the game would go on to be the best-selling GameCube title within the first week of its release, and naturally, most people played the game this way. That's the version I grew up with and loved. So it led me to explore the games I missed, and I wasn't disappointed. It's what got me into Sonic, and I know for sure that I'm not alone in that sentiment. Sonic would continue on after this, and eventually, the franchise became a joke in the general media. Not a joke like Bubsy or a movie tie-in game, no, it was really different. It became a thing that people were very engaged in. Seeing a high budget go towards disappointing, bad, or even downright horrible games from a franchise that used to be the top competitor to Mario, the mascot of a console lineup, that was what made Sonic the big controversy that it still is. But before all that, even with the massive changes and innovations made in Sonic Adventure, which no doubt turned off many people, the franchise was still held in a very high regard. People expected big things with this franchise, and Sonic Adventure 2 got that exact treatment. Sonic might appear on other next generation systems in the future, but right now, all I care about is playing one of the best Sonic games ever on one of the best consoles ever. If this is the last Sonic game in these declining Dreamcast years, it's satisfying to know that the Dreamcast didn't go out with a bang, but with a Sonic boom. Anthony Chow, IGN, 2001. Of course, I'm not old enough to know how it was really like back then. I only have critical records to go off of. I got into the series when games like Shadow of a Hedgehog and Sonic Riders were new. But what I can tell you is that from personal experience, Sonic Adventure 2 Battle was one of the premier GameCube titles in a list of primarily first-party games. Be them a kid, teen, or adult, everyone I knew who owned a GameCube played and loved Adventure 2. When Sonic got his legendary debut into Super Smash Bros, what music did they play? Green Hill Zone? <laughs> no. Sonic's the name, speeds my game. It's fucking live and learn from Sonic Adventure 2. And why? Well, I hope I did a fine enough job explaining that today. I still love the game so much that I can endlessly pop it in, beat it that same day, and have a grand old time. It's not too short to where I find it mindless, but not too long to where I don't want to see it through. A game which you'd think I would be bored of after all this time, but I'm not. The game had such a distinct appeal and legacy, which, if anything, I'd say proved that Sonic wasn't just a product of his time. The 90s cool factor of Sonic the Hedgehog was something that could be expanded, something to show that the franchise wasn't cool because it rode trends or anything, it was cool by being itself. It was about the heart. For Sonic Adventure 2 to be the culmination of everything one of the most important video game franchises would strive towards, that is why it's one of my favorite games of all time. And it's not impossible for it to be outdone.